send it to Maurice and he'll email it to you so you don't have to write it down. Um, so sometimes courses are called stays. And so that's, so sometimes I'll refer to them as stays. And um, here's a quote. They were a literal symbol of a woman's uprightness and value. And uh, for example, you can see on the bottom of this page, there was a poem in 1762 that describes a woman now a neat shape, a neat shape in stays, and now a slattern in dumps. And what that means is, I'll show you a picture of, of a dump. It's sort of a very soft corset that doesn't have pieces of metal and wood and boning in it, and it's much more comfortable. And yet, women were called slatternly when they wore that, as opposed to when they wore a, a real stay. So, um, and then the first quote that I have there. There were some fashions that allowed women to go stayless, meaning not wearing the corset. For example, that one kind of garment, which I don't know what that is, a, a dress, the, the robe baton. It could disguise an unsupported body, meaning you could walk around and not actually not wear your corset. But then of course, if you did that, there were rumors that you were pregnant or you were just slovenly or your morals were lax. And that's, that is what was assumed if you didn't wear your corset. So that's part of this concept that I have in my head of domination, forcing you to wear what's appropriate. So let's see what they are. So that is a jump. And uh, they were not, they didn't have boning in them. They were just kind of a stiff fabric that kept it from bouncing too much. And uh, this is from 1745, and it was billed as a healthier alternative to stays, but of course, less morally impeccable. So this was the very first type of corset, and they called it a cot, and it was from 1500. And that's the beginning of when the body began to conform to the shape of the clothing. You can see on the bottom, it looks like fringes. Those are cut so that the waistline can give way to the hips. So as you see on that little form, they spread out. And um, they were, some of these garments were actually quite lovely and they had the bones and the decorations and very nice fabrics. Uh, maybe not for the peasant women so much as for the aristocracy. <laughs> and uh, that's what this particular course it looked like in 1540. It was something that would um, bind your breasts and uh, slenderize your body and push you into that specific shape. So the fashion at the time was to push you down and uh, not enhance the bust. Um, at this point in time, 1600s, in this painting, it was quite different. And as you can see, it's much lower. It's supporting the bust, but it's not flattening it out. It's actually pushing it up. And um, that would be the, and the main reason to wear it was not so much for um, pushing down the stomach, but pushing up the bust so that it has a nice, quote, nice shape. Um, so we see this thing called the Spanish farthingale in Spain first. So I'm going to move also not, uh, I'm going to talk about something not only on the top of the body, but on the bottom of the body, not only corsets, but what happened with the skirt, because it was also a form of so, sort of social domination. Uh, the Spanish farthingale was these hoops of pain that were sewn into skirts. They were not undergarments, they were actually part of the skirt. And pain as in a hard, like a, a soft wood, but you know, a very hard kind of material that made the skirt stand away from the body like this. And that's what it looked like when it moved into undergarments. This is the Spanish farthingale, and um, they used a material that was a little springier that they called bent rope, and it was made out of reeds. So it was stiff, but maybe not as stiff as wood. Um, I, I know that that writing is really not uh, anything that you can read, but it was the picture that I had in mind. Um, that's why I put that picture in there on the slide with the two, um, the two Spanish farthingales. 
So uh, this is how it looked when it went from Spain to England in 1545. You can see the horizontal lines on the dress. And, um, you know, it made the dress stand away from the body and that was the whole purpose of it. And on top, there's that corset. It has a V shape at the bottom to draw the eye down from the waist, down to the hips and give you that slender look. And it's flattening at this point at the top. <clears throat> so um, the styles changed a little bit. And at this point, this is a farthingale that was worn underneath another dress that they called a French gown. And uh, the idea was the decoration of um, having two dresses and the one on the top just showed a little bit of this risque farthingale underneath it. And another way that they wore it, as they called it, um, like this was uh, in, under an English gown. And in this case, this gown had boning in the sleeves, the upper sleeves. So you can see they're gathered and it's stuck up because they use these reeds or painting or other very hard material to make the puffiness of the shoulders stand out. And so the English gown goes on top the way the French gown did. But it's open quite a bit so that you really see the skirt with the farthingale below it. So this is in 1563. That's a painting of Queen Elizabeth wearing a French gown over a French farthingale. And she's got something else at her hips. In addition to the corset, she's got wool batting. It's, it's actually some padding that she has all around her hips except for in the front and it makes it uh, stand away from the body right there at the hips and she also probably has some padding in her shoulders. So you know we've moved quite a bit farther from just a couple of hoops going around the skirt and now we have padding and boning stiffening against the body around the hips and around the shoulders and around the entire body. That's a picture, all, all these are famous people, these paintings, that's Catherine de Medici in the 1550s and she's got her own Spanish farthingale with the dress over the underdress. And here's something now it's going even beyond that called a French farthingale. And you can see what looks like there's actually a wheel or something under that skirt right at the hip. And it's making the skirt stand far away from the body. And you can see on their sleeves, even the men on the sleeves have these lines, these hoops of pain, making these sleeves absolutely immense, very thick and standing away from the body. And um, I'll show you uh, in a couple of slides what that actually, what those undergarments actually look like. So this is a fet where you can see that the wealthy are wearing Spanish farthingales. If you look in the picture, you can see who has money and who doesn't. The commoners and the merchants are not wearing farthingales and their skirts are not standing away from their body. But the wealthy people had money. So they were able to do it and they were worried about you know, being culturally acceptable. So that's what it looks like. This hoop on the right side is called a wheel farthingale. And it actually is a wheel all around the body. It's worn on top of the corset and it makes the skirt stand away from the body. And then down on the bottom of the skirt, <coughs> me, you can see, uh, you can see the, the way it stays away from the body, the, the hoops of pain around the bottom of the skirt. And you can see what she has in her sleeves. All of that caning is what those people were wearing in their sleeves to make their shoulders stand out and to make the sleeves very, very puffy. So that's the kind of sleeve that Queen Elizabeth has on her dress. And she has a, a French farthingale with a wheel underneath and they call them the farthingale sleeves. And th these are some other wheel farthingales. <coughs> And um, with the stay, so when I say with the stay, that's the corset part, the one in the center and the one on the right, two different corsets. So the corset on the right goes down in the center front 
and it's attached to the wheel farthingale with some bows. And then there is a cushion under the wheel farthingale that holds it up. Um, so there's a lot of stuff all around the body, a lot of stuff to contend with as you move through doorways and sit down and try to kind of generally live your life. And they got wider and wider and wider. So look at the one on the far right. It's just absolutely immense. It's just, uh, you can imagine going through doorways and wearing that. And the stays themselves got longer and longer in the front. And they got wider on the sides. They were no longer round at this point in time, 1750 to 80. They became just wide at the hips, and they called it a pannier, and another name for it being a hoop petticoat. <clears throat> so at this point, they could reach a width of nine feet. It could be nine feet wide. So you would imagine going through a doorway, you'd have to sort of turn sideways and go through that way. Um, so these are hoop petticoats and there's the stay. And again, you see the little, it looks like fringes, it's cut so that the hips, it can accommodate the hips. And the one in the center has the ties in the back. So, uh, you know, you couldn't get yourself into this. You have the people doing it for you. That's a close up of what the corset looked like. And in this case, the one on, the one on the left, um, I think that's actually the front, and that's those uh, lacings are decorative. And then there's also lacing in the back. And then the second one that's on the right, that is also the front, and you can see the pannier on the hips for both of them. Another picture of it, the lacing is in the back, the pannier is on the side, making uh, the dress pretty wide. Uh, this is Queen Sophia Magdalena's dress. That's where it's nine feet wide. Just incredible. So, I mean, that's her dressy dress. I, I don't know if she actually wore that every day, but she was an uh, aristocrat. I mean, being the queen. So she was in court and she had to be dressed perfectly all the time, unless maybe she wasn't going to be uh, seen. So generally, the aristocrats were wearing this all the time, but the commoners were not necessarily wearing these crazy paniers. I don't really know how they would get their work done if they're wearing these things, or how, they, how they'd even fit into their little houses. This is Marie Antoinette's wedding dress, and it's got that wide pannier that is nine or 10 feet wide, and it has diamonds all over the dress. It's um, probably very, it was probably very expensive. First time. Marcy. Yes. You knew this question was coming. How to go to the bathroom in that? Um, well, they lift the skirt up, they put a chamber pot underneath, and then they do it. I mean, it's it actually folds up. You know, the it's not you're not, not wearing a board all around, so you have strips that are separated by fabric and you can actually pull the skirt up. So um, does that answer the question? Thanks, Marcy. Yeah, you're welcome. Good question. We always wonder that. Um, so here, Queen Sophia Magdalena is absolutely gorgeous in this dress. Uh, I can imagine how heavy this thing must be. So, um, well. Okay, so at this point, 1774, we are changing all of a sudden to a new kind of style. It's called the round gown. And it, it really happened quite fast. The pannier went out and something like a bustle came in. So it was not a big, huge bustle like we see much later, 100 years later, but there was definitely a lot of padding just over the tush and the gown had to uh, accommodate that. And uh, also we can see something happened with the waistline. When you look at the waistline here, it's at the natural waist and the corset accommodates it at the hips and then goes down in the front. But all of a sudden, this round gown seems to have an entirely different look. The waistline has gone up to just under the bust 
and uh, it seems to be fairly flat in front, but the gown is actually gathered and uh, it's gathered on top as well in the bodice. And so it seems like the corset is going to have to be very different. And so the corset has still been like this, but it's changing a little bit. Uh, they call this the round gown, the precursor to the empire gown, the empire or otherwise known as Edwardian, which I'm going to go into in a few minutes. And um, it's a it's a precursor because of the extreme change. So this is this corset is not emphasizing the waistline, the narrow waistline that it was before. <clears throat> it's um, pushing up the bosom. And it's going down in front a little bit, but it's really not as severe as it was before. <clears throat> and here we can see that it even got a little shorter and it's a little bit softer. And they call it half boned because some of these bone, the, you can see a lot of the channels, the stitching on there where they put boning in it, but uh, some of them are stronger than others. So uh, in all of the corsets, in all of the years, sorry, there was always something in front called a bust. Um, when I, or maybe I can, if you can see the front view on the corset on the right, it's stitched down around the bust, which is a very hard piece of boning or wood. And that makes it absolutely impossible for you to bend over from the waist. But the things that are on the side, they might just be cording. So that's why they called it a half boned stay. There might be just some of them that actually had the hard boning in them. And they were adjustable. Like you can see the part that goes over the shoulder. I have a little arrow here. There's the bow and you can adjust it right there by tying it. And of course you would um, tie it in the back. So at some point, they also were changing in terms of the breast. They, they began to have two individual shapes, two separate shapes. And there also began to be sort of a forward thrust of the bust. Um, so the body was pushed into a totally separate type of position from the way it was before. So um, the round gown was a precursor to this kind of look. The one on the left, it was this is what they call the Regency period in England. It still went down in the back and it had uh, some width in the hips, but the front began to have this higher bust line. Uh, and eventually it's the um, here bust line. So just under the bust. Um, we are actually very familiar with the Bridgerton. Has everybody seen the Bridgerton TV show? And we're watching it, paying attention to their dresses. And so I'm going to show you a couple pictures later on from actual uh, the characters from Bridgerton. And this probably is what they wore underneath. All of a sudden, things were different. They had what they call half stays since they didn't have to worry about keeping the body uh, flat underneath the bus, they, didn't, they actually didn't pay attention to wearing corsets like they did in the 1700s. Bridgerton, I think, takes place in 1812. <clears throat> and things didn't change too quickly. They took a really long time. And there's no definite period where it begins and where it ends. So when I say Regency gown, Regency period, and the umpire period, it's all running from the late 1700s through um, to like through 1820. And um, so I would say Bridgerton is right in the middle of that. And they wore these little half stays around that time period where they, they separated the bust into two separate breaths, which is very different from what they had before. And they were short and it sort of looked like uh, like a proto bra kind of thing. And um, it didn't actually didn't even flatten the bust. So it was sort of like a bra. And then this one, they I, when you look at it online, they even call it a proto bra because it actually, it has a bust in the middle. 
the busk in the middle is that if you can look in the very center of this, it's a channel that a piece of painting was placed into. So it still had that, but there was, it was very short. It just went under the bus. It just pushed the bust up a little bit and it had separate cups for the breast. And here's another one. It was really tiny. This was, a, it, it wasn't meant to shape the breast the way we do today. It just was meant to support the bust a little bit. And it's just so, so small. It just goes over the shoulders and there's that little buckle to adjust it and it ties in the back. So it must have felt a lot better to wear this kind of thing to these people, but it didn't last forever. But in addition to that, they also wore petticoats. So you can see this ad two strap high waisted upper petticoat. And that's the time period when they were wearing it, 1789 to 1825. Um, and they um, they didn't just have one, they had several petticoats because they had to wear one under the corset then had to wear one over the corset to protect the dress so it wouldn't get rubbed raw by any of the hard pieces of wood in the corset. Marcy, we have another question. Yes. Did the photo bras help with posture? I would call them proto bras, as in like prototype for a bra. <clears throat> the little tiny bra, the little proto bras didn't do anything for posture. They were just, they were so small, they did nothing. They just kind of pushed up the bus a little bit. But the rest of all of these other corsets, they did. <clears throat> Sorry, every time I talk like this for an hour, I lose my voice. Um, these did affect the posture because, you know, it was covering so much more of your body. And you could not, you couldn't bend over to the side. You couldn't bend forward. That little tiny one in the center, the brown one, which looks so pretty, that didn't really have an effect on your posture, but the rest of it, absolutely, the busk in the center, which you can see in the corset on the right, it, it totally prevented you from being able to bend over. Here's another couple of corsets. Um, they might have worn this. The Bridgerton people might have worn these. The one on the right is called a wrapped corset for obvious reasons. And um, the one on the left, it's, it's just very light. It still has the busk in front. It has a little bit of support right under the breast, but it really doesn't have any boning in there. And um, so it was a lot softer and easier to use. And this is what the dresses look like, the umpire dresses. Uh, in the early part of the 1800s, they were muslin from India and they were white. That was totally the style. Um, and it was that way for about 10 years. It was just white. And it was, we also call it neoclassical, meaning they're referring back to the classical time period of ancient Greece. Um, they weren't actually draped the way they would have been in Greece, but it still feels that way. So the corsets that were underneath were these little teeny tiny things, uh, totally not needed to hold in the stomach, just to hold up the bust. There is Josephine in her lovely little tiny dress. And it looks like her dress just barely covers her nipples. There it is. And another word for it was boobs on a tube. That's what they call that kind of dress because it's just really, uh, I don't even know how they fit the bust into it. Uh, I mean, Daphne on the left, I suspect some of her breasts are underneath that little teeny tiny line, you know, the waistline. Um, the queen in the middle, she's wearing an older kind of dress and she always does in this Bridgerton show. And I always wonder about that. I feel like she's, um, Maybe she's old fashioned and she's wearing an older style. I, I don't quite understand why she's not wearing the Ampere look. But all of the other girls, even though you, you, you look at them and you know their boobs must be bigger, somehow they make them look much smaller wearing these little tiny dresses. 
that's a very famous painting. Uh, another breast that's a boob on a tube. And that would be the coat, an impure kind of coat. They're called a redding goat, which is uh, actually a bastardization of a riding coat, meaning when they go riding on their horses, I guess. And another jacket they wore was this teeny tiny little Spencer jacket. So now this is already 1815. And by then they started wearing different fabrics. And here's the little story. Um, the reason fabrics change is because Napoleon did it. He passed a decree that made it illegal for anybody to wear anything but French materials. And they were using, they had been using this muslin fabric from India, and now they couldn't wear that anymore. So they had to use silk because they didn't uh, make that kind of fabric in France. And so everything changed. And that white umpire dress that was ubiquitous in the early 1800s was totally gone. And then um, everything happened, everything changed with the corset as well. The little teeny tiny proto bras, you know, they're totally gone. And the corsets started coming back. Uh, just the way they were before. And it was, it was like for a while, people didn't feel that domination through their clothing and then, and then it started coming back again. So already this is silk, it is white, but it's not at all the same as those uh, lovely white muslin dresses. It's a much stiffer fabric and it's very stiff on the bottom. There's that roll all around the bottom of the dress and um, all of the embroidery and applique on the bottom is very stiff. And, um, and up at the top, I'm sure she's wearing a different kind of corset. Uh, and then things start changing. Uh, a lot of very stiff elements applique to the dress, but also the sleeves all of a sudden became very important. I'm, I'm saying all of a sudden, I mean, it took several years, but it, I guess it felt suddenly to them and the sleeves began to get all poofy. And um, the design, whole design element of the dress was now moving to the sleeves. And they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, they called these leg of mutton sleeves. So they stuck out not just because the dress at, at that point, the sleeve was gathered, which it was, it was a ton of fabric in the shoulder. <clears throat> but also because now there was a lot of padding happening up there and uh, probably boning. So here's the kind of thing they would have been wearing. Here's the leg of mutton sleeve. It just got absolutely immense. And there's a little boned thing that they had to wear. You can see on the right uh, on each arm. And so it tied around the shoulder and it tied on the upper arm and then those lines in the middle of the fabric are um, actually very stiff pieces of boning reeds or some kind of other stiff material. And then the shoulders began to show and the dresses got lower and lower on the shoulders. That's another thing that they had, they, they had sleeve puffs. So this goes on one arm then you had another one on the other arm and it's got padding in there. So that is a petticoat that was worn underneath the dress and it had sleeve supports in it, boning supports. It had cording and boning. And then in this, this is an all-in-one kind of garment. So this particular corset also has that busk in the center front. You can see that very wide panel. And so this, this piece of wood would be, it would be slid into that, but then when it was washed, they would take the wood out. That's why it's not a permanent part of the corset. And then there was also inside underneath it, we can't really see it, but there was a pocket and they put paperboard in there to flatten the stomach. So this is now, we're, we're now up to 1839 <clears throat> and everything started to focus on the figure which uh, it wasn't before. It, it was the boobs on the tube before and nobody was paying attention to the figure and now it's becoming an hourglass. That's the first time we see an hourglass which stays in fashion for decades. So um, there were bust gussets. Those are um, just, it's just the way the, the whole corset is shaped just above the waist. 
and uh, a lot of the bust would be pushed up. This this particular mannequin doesn't have much of a bust, but a real human being would have uh, all of her soft tissue above this um, kind of flattening corset. Same with that. This is 1839 to 41. And there's something now that we see called flossing and that's embroidery. Um, you can see, can, I don't know if you can see this little arrow, you know, my, my cursor, I'm pointing. Is that visible? Yeah, okay. So there's a little bit of embroidery at the top and at the bottom of the boning stays. And it, it makes them stay in one place. Um, because with these corsets, the boning, the boning is stiff and it cuts holes in the fabric and it just rips up the fabric and it moves around as you move around throughout the day. And then it also could totally rub your skin and you know just cause injuries. And uh, I don't know why it took them so long to figure this out, but the flossing holds them in place and it softens it a little bit. It's probably still not entirely comfortable. So again, the, at the top of the corset, it's fairly flat and your soft tissue has to go somewhere if it doesn't fit in there and it would push it up to above that. So um, the shoulders are totally exposed. So you can imagine you might be cold, what you're doing for fashion. So they have this new kind of garment, they called it a pelerine, which is a little cape, little teeny tiny cape that they put over the shoulders. So first they expose the shoulders and then they give you a cape you can put on the shoulders, just in case you're cold. And the skirt now is getting short. It's actually shorter, it's revealing the ankle, which I guess that was very sexy at the time. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden the sleeves changed in the 1840s and they became very, very straight. And the dresses were up on the shoulders. I mean, it just went from like that uh oh, sorry, my computer just asked me to do a dumb question. So it, it all of a sudden went from, it went from this where the shoulders were showing to no shoulders are showing, we're all covered up, no big wide sleeves, everything is perfectly straight and back to the boning in the corset and um, the dress was getting longer again. So that's what was going on underneath. So there's still that channel for the bust made out of wood or whalebone, and the corset is getting longer and it's uh, pushing the body around. There they are. They do not look very happy. But uh, what's so interesting is that this is a photograph and it's 1840, and I guess, you know, a photograph is fairly new for them. So um, they're all tied up. There nothing, there's no skin showing, no more shoulders are showing, the dresses are very high around the neck. And there it is again. And at, at this point, the sleeves were so tight around the armhole that they, that's another form of domination through your clothing. The women were not even able to raise their arms. And this is what's going on underneath, below the waist. They wanted the skirts to stick out they were not wearing the farthingales anymore. So they had many, many petticoats, six to seven very heavy petticoats. And all these garments probably weighed a lot. So somebody came up with bloomers. Um, I don't know who designed it, but it was named after this woman, Amelia Bloomer, who campaigned for women's rights. This is the very first time that women started campaigning for women's rights. So I know you've heard of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady. Stanton, and this is when they were active, right during this time period. So bloomers could look several different ways. On the left, there was they were underneath a dress just for daily wear, and the second one from the left was a little dressier. Um, the one on the right, as um, as we keep moving towards the right. Um, was definitely wearing a corset. It was a little sexier. It was a little lower in front. So just the way dresses had been before. But underneath it all, there there were still the bloomers. And then that outfit on the the farthest 
right was absolutely incredible because these bloomers actually look like pants and uh, women were not wearing pants yet. So these came out of totally nowhere. And as you can imagine, they were not appropriate. This whole style only lasted about a year. And uh, a lot of the women, the um, suffragists wanted to wear clothing like this because they wanted to liberate themselves and allow themselves ease of movement to not be dominated by the garments. But it was um, considered, of course, you had low morals if you were wearing anything like this because your legs were showing. So um, I guess it was very hard to go against society and wear clothing that was so different like this. Certainly you wouldn't be able to catch a man to get married. And this is the men's reaction to the bloomer. They felt women were attempting to reverse the power of the sexes so that men would no longer be on top. And so it says there in the cartoon, results of bloomerism, the ladies pop the question. So all the ladies are wearing these short skirts and pants. And there's the lady asking the, husband, the man to be her husband. And he says, oh, you must really ask mama. So totally laughing at the idea that women could be on top. Uh, and this is what the corset looked like. And here is the very first time we see something that actually makes life a little easier for women, the front opening corset. So you didn't have to have somebody else helping you get dressed. And you can see the little white triangles. That's the flossing. So those are the stays in there, the, the um, very hard pieces of wood, where the boning was in there right where those little flossings are embroidered. So a new invention that freed up women from all that weight was the crinoline, the cage crinoline. And uh, this is what I was talking about when uh, we had that question of how do people go to the bathroom? Before with the Spanish farthingale, and I said the boning was separated by fabric. And this is sort of a version of that. These, this is a, it's like a cage made out of uh, very thin pieces of, of wood or, or cane, caning material held together by ribbon. And if you wanted to, you could pick the whole thing up. Like you pick up your skirt, you could just pick up this whole crinoline. And you know, if it's muddy on the ground and you want to walk carefully, or if you have to go to the bathroom, that's how you would do it. And there's the cage crinoline. On the bottom, you could see how you could just pick it up if you needed, like an accordion. And also there was a cage crinoline in the back on uh, a forming a bustle from the back of this. So the, she had to wear a slip under that and she had to wear a corset on top of the slip you can see that little brown corset it's a full slip it's got sleeves and then it goes up above the corset and then comes the cage crinoline and then she had to wear a slip on top of that covering it and then her dress and maybe even several layers of fabric so each layer of fabric is protecting the next garment from her skin or from the corset or from the cage crinoline or uh, protecting the final garment from all of that. So 1864, this is when the dresses at the bottom, the skirts were just as wide as they had ever been. But they were wide at the very bottom, not necessarily at the hips like that pannier that we saw, you know, way back in the 1700s. So um, what was going on at this time was the Impressionists were beginning to get their painting done. Um, they weren't known as Impressionists yet, but they were young. Monet and Rembrandt and all of those people were young and still, um, uh, we've seen some paintings that Monet has done of Madame Monet wearing in the garden wearing her lovely white dress. And these are styles that she was wearing. Anybody know what that is? That looks familiar. So that's the movie Gone with the Wind. And, you know, she took her curtains down to make this dress. Um, so that's that time period, just about when this all this was happening, it was 1864. And then I want you to tell me if you know what this is. Does that look familiar? Yeah. Went with the wind. 
one of my favorite comedians, favorite TV shows. She saw uh, she saw something in the window and she knew she just had to have it. She saw the curtains in the window. That's what she said. And then finally, the bustle, the super huge, huge bustle is making its appearance. And it just all of a sudden gets immense. It was, there was a little tiny thing happening before, but then all of a sudden it gets to be like almost three times the width of the body sticking out in the back. And that's what was going on underneath. That's what was making the skirt stick out. So those are all boning, pieces of boning. And it just got bigger and bigger. So still there was a corset underneath, but you can see how this was changing the look of the woman's body. And the whole idea of her body looking like she was sticking her stomach out and her push out, um, that really took a hold of the culture and it became the way things had to look. This is what goes underneath. It's got a cage crinoline, they call it a crinolette petticoat with a bustle. And it has steel half hoops, steel. And all of a sudden, there was something new. The bustle changed very quickly, and I mean quickly, in 1877. And it took on this, what they call the natural form of the bustle. The natural form was. It's not like really like a woman's natural body, but it's funny. It, it took that bulk of the bustle and it lowered it way low down where her tush was. And um, it still pushed the dress out behind her, but it was not right at the waist anymore. Like the way it was there, it was just like a, a seat that somebody could sit on. And then it totally went vertical. And that's how it looked. And it was caused for decoration, lots of bows. And this is what was going on underneath it. There were many ways it could be designed. It could be, as you see on the left, this little, um, little padding that would tie around the waist. And on top of that would be a slip. And um, on the right, there's another way that it could be. It could have the boning totally shaping the body just from the waist down. So it had the boning at the hip and then it had the boning at the bottom and gradually the loops getting wider at the very bottom of the skirt. Or it could be this. These are also page bustles. A lot of different manufacturers made them in different ways. So it could be something you had to wear just around your waist with these boning, pieces of boning attached by ribbons or it could be a full length page crinolette with boning in it for the bustle. And that's another one. So on top of your corset, you would tie this, this thing around your waist and it had steel bands and the braid covered it. And all of a sudden that big, huge bustle came back again. It disappeared and it was the natural push and it came right back again in 1883 with lots and lots and lots of fabric. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the well-to-do women had very much more fabric than the peasant women because it was very expensive and they just, it just took up so much fabric, very expensive satins and laces and just probably made a, a real obvious divide between the wealthier classes and the people who were not as wealthy. I love this picture because it's the various forms of bustles that, that people came up with in their imagination that were worn as undergarments. And also there are all sorts of ties and buckles and belts that women had around their waist. In addition to the corsets, they were wearing all this stuff on the bottom. So there's the bustle again, like a seat somebody could sit on. and. Um, and something is now happening with the way the corset is shaping the human figure, the body in the front. 
And uh, the, the bust is no longer separated like it was earlier in this century. It's now like a, they called it a mono bosom. It's just one big wide thing in the front. So I'll show you some more pictures of it. So they called this, this bustle the lobster tail. It just stuck out really far in the back. And back to the leg of button sleeve, again with boning. So at this point, they were wearing the corset. They had stiff boning around the whole body. They had stiff boning and padding in the sleeves, upper parts of the sleeves, very tight lower sleeves. And then they had all their boning down below and uh, in the crinolettes and the bustles behind them. And uh, there is, this is the late 1890s where they started changing the shape of the corset. And so the body is now pushed forward and the stomach's pushed forward and the tush is pushed back. It's, uh, and it's a monobism look. There's, I have some more really wonderful pictures. You see that dancer, La Sophie? La Sophie, whatever her name is. That's, we see a lot of pictures of her in that position where she dances, she's, she's a, a contortionist really. And she's able to put her body in that position that all the women thought was the most beautiful position you can be in. And the course that made women have that position, but she just did it naturally. In that picture in the middle, you can see how much she can, can put her body. And the picture on the right, that's a, that's you know, the same posture, and the corset is giving her that position. And that was the epitome of womanly beauty, and the epitome, the highest point of women totally changing what their natural body should really look like. And this is the corset that was doing it. The flossing has become lovely and decorative on the bottom, the little white embroidered parts. And, um, and there it is on the top, pushing up the breasts, but not separating them. And that is an 18 inch waist. So this is the look of, this is a perfect look of the mono bosom. And they called it the S-bend corset. And um, because I guess it contorts the body into an S shape. Uh, they also called it the health corset, which I cannot understand. And it's an 18 inch waist, which it, you could only keep if you were small to begin with. And if you kept the corset on all the time, because <clears throat> it moves around the organs in the body. And if you don't wear the corset all the time, then the organs go back to where they're supposed to be, basically. And the epitome of this was the Gibson girl. You might have heard of the Gibson girl. And it was originally, it came from a drawing by Charles Dana Gibson. And they had a contest and uh, this girl won. Her name is Camille Clifford. And she, she was known as the first actual Gibson girl. And she became quite famous as the Gibson girl. And she became an actress because she won this contest. And um, she did, I don't, I don't know if she was a great actress, but everybody knew who she was. There she is again. She had this absolutely, what they thought was a perfect Gibson girl figure, thanks to the corset. And uh, absolutely tiny, teeny tiny waist, and you can see how she's lying on the sofa. She can't really cannot bend her body. <laughs> and absolutely huge bust and huge hips. That's the Gibson girl look. And this is the difference between the way it had been before on the left and the way it is now. And this is the picture on the left, the way it is the old style corset and the new figure, the Gibson girl figure. It was totally leaning forward and um, shoulders back and push back and it widened the hips. You can see this girl on the right and it, it forced her body to conform to that perfect ideal of beauty. And this is what it looked like on the body. On the left was the old hourglass figure and on the right, 
see the arrows, what the S bend corset did. You know, just, just imagine, do that with your, your own body, you know, move your tush back and you can see how it moves your hips down and your stomach forward. Not, not really probably so good for your back. And it sort of developed in 1900 into this powder pigeon look, which they call the powder pigeon because that's, I guess, what a pigeon breath looks like. Like when those birds walk around on the street, they actually look like that. And so it was a totally obscuring a, a woman's natural breast. Um, they were now, it was still the monobosom and they, they put stuffing in there to make it really stick out. It, it's kind of funny to us now because it doesn't look in any way beautiful, but that's exactly what they wanted to wear then. So there they are, these lovely librarian type ladies are all wearing that powder pigeon blouse with a lot of gathers in front. And there is a, a very probably dressy dress that was worn at the time, again, with this probably stuffing in the front down up just above the waistline. And there is an ad because if you were too thin, that was a problem. It was a uh, problem thin figures. So if you were, if you bought this corset, it gave you well-rounded hips in any gown. So that was totally desirable. And there it is, a perfect bust. This is nature's rival for flat-chested women and for those who are not fully developed at the bust line. So the bust line 100 years ago before this particular corset had to be very small and they had the teeny tiny little proto bras to push it up and obscure the bust. And now the whole idea was to make the bust, the mono bosom absolutely huge to get a perfect figure. And then everything changed again. And around this time in 1910, the whole idea was to have a straight vertical line with garters that held up the stocking. So you can see how long the corset has become. I mean, those figures are fashion figures anyway, they're a little bit too long, but the corset has become much longer than it ever was before. And that's how it looked. Still, there had to be a slip underneath and a corset worn on top of the slip. And someone still had to tie you into it. And this is the way dresses were now becoming. So uh, very different from the powder pigeon look. Now the waistline is, is raised a little bit. So it's not at the natural waist. It's a little bit higher. And the dresses are uh, now ankle length. And then there are changes that are happening. And then along comes this hobble skirt. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hobble skirt, but it was called that because you could not walk with it. And the whole point was a tight band around the knees, just below the knees. Uh, also notice the speed limit skirt so that you wouldn't go too far. That was a very well-dressed woman from 1913. I'm not quite sure if that's a hobble skirt. It's not, it looks like it's pants, but I don't think it's pants. So there's her corset. It's quite long. It's um, covering the bust but it's no longer the S-shaped corset now, and it's a little bit softer than it was before. And finally, the very first time it happens in 1917, the brassiere appears. <clears throat> it's still a monobosom, but now they call it a brassiere in the ads. It's no longer considered a corset. And in the middle ad, you can see no more will that ugly corset ridge keep her guessing and fidgeting. Uh, I guess she's guessing if she's coming apart. She felt that you know all the pieces of underwear she was wearing were totally coming apart. And this is how the clothing was changing. The waistline is now dropping and it's going now below the natural waist and the skirts are still ankle length. <clears throat> 
and um, the waistline continues to move down or just above, but never at the natural waistline. And at this point, by the 20s, the waistline was at the hips. So this, this is 1923. This is just before the flapper era. And what I think is really amazing is you can see in this ad on the left, there's a sports suit that a woman could wear, which uh, is freeing up this woman even more. And these are beginning to look more and more like flapper dresses. They're still quite long and the waistline is still below the hips, but everything has become very flat. The, the boobs, the, the bust line is really flat. The hips are really flat. And it has now sort of moved into what the flapper era is gonna be all about, which is a boyish look. And all of a sudden in 1925, the waistline disappeared completely and the skirt rose. There's the difference between 1924 and 1925. The waistline totally gets higher and it's a very straight look. There it is, the length changes. Another wonderful picture about these beautiful dresses. And there becomes a distinct difference between the top and the bottom of the dress. The bodice is the top part and the skirt is the bottom. And that's what's going on underneath. It's a very straight line. They called it a brazier corset. And the whole idea was now to not have boobs. Before, uh, 20 years before that, it was to have a big chest. Now the idea was not to have a big chest, to have a long flattening brazier and corset, to flatten everything out. And the, in order to do that, they had these bust flattening bandeaus. They were bust flattening. Actually, not unlike a sports bra that we wear today. Uh, you know, made differently, but the same idea, but um, not for the same reason. I mean, it's so you don't bounce around now when you're doing your sports activities, but there in the 1920s, it was look boyish. The boyish look was perfect. That's Clara Bow. She obviously was very small and she had the ideal boyish look. And for older woman, women, they could have these now boneless brassieres. They could attach the girdle. They had all those little clips. And then they attached the girdle with clips to the stockings. So they still had a, a lot of stuff to contend with, but they really, they were still trying to make themselves very flat. And for stout women, they wanted to restrain any fleshiness. So they were wearing all sorts of things like this to push themselves in, which I guess they're kind of similar to what we're doing today, wearing skims. And they called them brassiers. And here's a reducing rubber brassiere, the idea that if you sweat, you can reduce your size. And this was the corset at the time. It was unboned, comfortable for sports and dancing. And it had, now it had those little clips that held up your stockings. Of course, you had to wear a slip underneath because you had still to protect the body from the corset. And we're coming down the home stretch. This is my last slide because this is finally for young women, an unstructured brassiere. It finally is not meant to flatten the bust. It's actually like the very first bra. And from then on, we're all totally familiar with what bras and panties look like. And so I didn't go any further with my little research here because this was the, the epitome, 1926, the epitome of finally getting rid of the corset even though women, if older women wanted to, they could still wear a girdle and we still you know, want to keep ourselves in, but we're no longer wearing bony and we're no longer hopefully dominated by our undergarments. So um, 
So that's it. Now I'd like to know if anybody has any further questions. You can mute yourself or you can uh, do a chat, maybe, and Maurice can check it out. Unmute if you'd like to. Nope. So, okay. So, um, Maurice, are you there? I'm here. Okay, great. So I'm uh, I'm finished. It looks like there are no questions. And um, uh, we have a few questions in chat coming. Wait for come in. Um, we, I can take everyone off chat too if you guys want to ask questions. I'm going to start with the chat queue. Um, when did the girl make an appearance? The girl. The girdle. Girdle. Oh. Um, at this right about this point um, here, it's it's coming because you can see uh, the clips here are attaching to the stockings, which is what the girdle did. But it's still in 1928. It's still one piece with the, the part that goes on the body. And right here, well, it's all it's hard to say. It's exactly like 1926, 27, 20. But during this period, this is where it all became separated. The bra separated from the bottom. So it's at that point that if, if the older women wanted, they could wear a separate garment that they called the girdle. What else? Okay, we allowed everyone to unmute themselves. I took everyone, um, you can now do that now. Okay, and anybody well, want to? There's one that says from Catherine Temesic that is it the case that during the 1940s, with many women working in factories, etc., that undergarments became looser and girdles were, and then it breaks off. Let's see if I can push it down. So anyway, that's an interesting question. Like what happens? with the undergarments when women um, start working? Um, I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I can't see why working would change anything because really we were, uh, what we were wearing was, I guess everything determined what we were wearing, but you know, socially we were looking a, uh, in a particular way. Be, the reason we were looking the way we did was because of social pressures. And um, I know that the garments themselves changed because there wasn't enough fabric to go around and all of a sudden clothing, uh, skirts were shorter and they were um, like in the 30s, certainly there was a lot more fabric in the dresses than there were in the 40s. But, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know if that would change what the garment underneath was because basically we wanted to flatten our stomach and we had separate bras and girdles and we were not trying to flatten on top or make it larger or smaller the way we were throughout the decades before that. So um, the social reasons for wearing a girdle were not really different. You know, the way we wanted to look, if we, were, we felt we were too fat, we wanted to look a little skinnier, it didn't have anything to do with working. It was just how we felt about our bodies at the time. But it would be a good question to look into. RC, great presentation. Thank you, Donna. Great, great job. Look forward to your next class. Yeah. <laughs> put a lot of work into that, I can tell. Oh my God. A lot, yep. of, a lot of hours. A lot of, a lot of hours. And every time I looked at it, I would just, I would add more and more and more pictures. Well, it's a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any, any other thoughts? Any comments? Uh, did you did you absolutely love or hate any of the courses? Would you would you wish you were wearing those outfits now? No. No. Often asked, who determined the changes? I mean, were they the couturier or the, not the local dressmaker? You know, that's a really good question. Um, couturiers were not really operating. Charlesworth was the first one. He was late 1800s, but 
there weren't any, there were local dressmakers before that who were making the garments or women made their own. But, um, you know, I think uh, sometimes it was political. Like I, I, I mentioned that Napoleon had a lot to do with what the fabric was, but yeah. wow, I don't know what actually determined what the body shape should be for any particular time. Really the first couturier? Sorry? Worth was the first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. And in terms of there, there were people who determined style, but he was he was he was known as the first because he marketed himself. Yeah. That's that's why he was the first. Yeah. You use terms like was that um, boob on a tube and <laughs> concepts like that. Was that stuff? Was that like stuff you made up like contemporary terms? Was that term that you used at that time? We call it that now. I don't think they called it that then. Yeah. I don't know. It's just it's just one of those phrases that gets thrown around a lot, but I, I really seriously doubt they were using that phrase back then. There's a question here that says, did all countries of Europe adopt the same fashions? Um, there were, that's a really good question. Uh, there was actually communication between the countries and they actually did, but they, they had slight differences. Like going back to the 1500s, they had farthingales. It started in Spain and then it eventually moved to England. And then there was the farthingale under a French gown, which was one kind of style. And then there was the farthingale under the English gown, which is another kind of style. So there were local differences, but, um, but people did travel and they did see the styles that were happening in other countries. And so, yeah, you know, the styles were definitely, they, they had those styles in common. And then there were countries like Russia where they, they didn't come up with anything necessarily new and they absolutely wanted to feel part of Europe, especially in the 1700s with Catherine the Great, they really wanted to feel part of Europe. And they so they spoke French and they wore French gowns and they adopted French cultural attitudes. And a lot of other countries in Eastern Europe were doing the same to really feel part of the center of culture, which probably was France, which it still is, I guess. Or maybe.